let's do a case that is mostly solvable and illustrates all these things. It's a very entertaining case. It's called uh, Landau-Zenner transitions. Uh, for these two people, Lev Landau, that you've probably heard from Landau and Lifshitz, uh, he's the first person that tried to do this. And uh, Zenner did, did it more carefully. In fact, apparently found that uh, Landau made a factor of two error. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and the paper of Zenner, it's actually quite nice, and, uh, and it's a very uh, nice example that illustrates the physics of this transition. So, we'll devote the rest of the lecture today to that Landau-Zenner thing. Okay, so it will give us uh, a little bit into the spirit of uh, the adiabatic uh, approximation in the language that Barry used. So Landau, Zenner, transitions. Okay, Zenner and Landau were interested in molecules. And uh, some way of thinking of molecules is to think of nuclei as fixed, separated by some distance r. And then you assume they are fixed and they are separated by some distance r. And then you calculate what is the electronic configuration. So Zener imagined that you would have psi 1, one electronic configuration. Um, it's a wave function that depends on some x's for the electrons, but it represents the situation where the two protons, say for a simple molecule, maybe they're more distances, but in particular, they are separated by a distance r. So that's an electronic configuration. Electronic configuration. Protons a distance r away. And suppose there's another configuration, psi 2 of r. It's another configuration. So two configurations. Two different states. Maybe in the first state, the electrons are in some ground state. In the second state, they're in some kind of excited state. Uh, two different configurations. Now. We could plot, so we'll have them here, distance r, and here's the cloud of electrons. We could plot a graph as a function of the separation. What are the values of the energies? And uh, here is one possibility for the states, and here's another one. And that's a plot of the style that Zenner drew in his paper. And uh, this represents E1 of R and this E2 of R. That is the energy of the first state, the energy of the second state, as a function of R. So we are having here, oops, two energy eigenstates. So we have H of R. The Hamiltonian depends on the R. And basically, you're putting the two protons at the distance R and calculating the electrons, how they move. Psi I of X 
R equal EI of R psi I of XR. This is for I equal 1 and 2. The case that the people were interested in was a case where this molecule here, for example, in the state 2, for this value of R, there's a critical R0 where things, the levels get very close. For some value of R, this molecule, for example, could be a polar molecule. A polar molecule is a molecule that has a permanent dipole moment. It has plus charges and minus charges not evenly distributed, so you get a dipole. And maybe here, the molecule is nonpolar. And here, it's nonpolar. Here, polar. So if you would follow one of the energy eigenstates, there's a critical value of R where the electronic configuration is such that it goes from nonpolar to polar, and in the other energy eigenstate, it goes from polar to nonpolar. So the question is, well, okay, what? First of all, what does all this have to do with instantaneous energy eigenstates and time dependence? Why, why are we thinking about this? Um, the issue is that sometimes you can think of these molecules as forming or being subjected to extra interactions in which you would have a process or a reaction in which the radius changes in time. So it's possible under some configuration that R becomes R of T. And then this Hamiltonian is a Hamiltonian that depends on R of T. This wave functions psi I R R of T, E I's become R of T, and Psi I's become X of R of T. This is an important point. It's simple but important. Most important points in physics are simple, but you have to stop and recognize that something is a slightly new is happening here. If you have solved this equation for all values of R. If you know those energy eigenstates for all separations of the molecule, you now have found instantaneous energy eigenstates if it so happens that R is a function of T. Because if this is true for any value of this letter R, well, then this is true for all times. Because for any specific time, this is the R, the same R is here, the same R is here, and the same R is here, and that equation holds for all R. So if this can be solved for all R, this holds for all times. And you have your instantaneous energy eigenstates. You have found those instantaneous energy eigenstates. And therefore, uh, the instantaneous energy eigenstates are these ones. And the instantaneous energies are these ones. So many times uh, in quantum mechanics you do that. You solve for the energy eigenstates for a whole range of some parameters, and then it so happens that those parameters may change in time, but then you have found the instantaneous energy eigenstates for all times. So 
in that picture, we have a following situation in which the energies now could be thought if, if R is some function alpha of t, then the same picture would basically hold true for time here and the energies as a function of time. Because as time changes, R changes, and as R changes, you already know how the figure looks. So this is a figure of the energy levels as a function of time. And now the physical question uh, is, do we get a transition or not? Uh, so the adiabatic theorem would say, OK, you should state in your instantaneous energy eigenstate. But we're going to get precisely to this situation where uh, these things could be so small, so little, that there's a possibility of a non-adiabatic transition in which you jump to the other one because the gap is small. So this goes to the real physics of the adiabatic theorem. Can we get an estimate or a calculation that tells us how much probability you have of jumping the gap and going to the other branch? That's what we're going to try to do. So for that, uh, We'll do a particular example. So let's uh, do that. It's an easy one to begin with. Um, I'll erase this. So baby example. Toy example. Example. So I'll take a Hamiltonian. H of t, which is going to be of this form, time-dependent one, but relatively simple. Elements just along the diagonal. OK, that's your Hamiltonian. A two by two matrix, elements on the diagonal, but just simple things, the same thing. So let's calculate the instantaneous energy eigenstates. OK, sounds like a task. It's actually pretty simple. The instantaneous energy eigenstates are 1, 0, and 0, 1. They don't depend on time because essentially this Hamiltonian is just alpha t over 2, 1 minus 1, 0, 0. It's, it's a, constant times an, a constant matrix times an overall factor. Now, the eigenstates of this matrix are 1, 0, and 0, 1. And they are the eigenstates of this matrix for any time, because the time goes in front. The matrix doesn't quite change shape. So these are the instantaneous energy eigenstates. They are good forever. Um, to plot this, I will assume from now on that alpha is positive. The energy of the first state is, well, what do you get when you up with Hamiltonian on this state? The matrix gives you the state back, and this is just alpha t over 2. And the energy of the second state is going to be minus alpha t over 2. We can plot those energies. And uh, here is um, the energy of the first state is alpha t over 2. Um, with alpha positive, this is like this. I think I'll put it here. This is the state 1, 0 is here. 1, 0 is here. Alpha t 
over state here is the energy E1 of t. The energy is time dependent. Here is time, and here are energies. This is E1. And then we have the E2 is the other one that goes like this. It's state 0, 1. That's the state 2, 0, 1. And the energy is E2 of t, which is minus alpha t over 2. So it's negative for large positive time and positive for the other one. So these are your instantaneous energy eigenstates. OK, and this is not quite what we wanted here. We wanted things to avoid themselves. But uh, this is going to illustrate an important uh, effect. I claim, actually, that the true solutions of the Schrodinger equation are, in this case, dressed up versions of the instantaneous energy eigenstates. Uh, so what I claim is that kind of you do the adiabatic state corresponding to this, the adiabatic state corresponding to that, and those are exact solutions. So there's no coupling between the states, one and two, so this, this is plausible. So let's write those... Uh, Solutions. I claim here is psi 1 of t. I claim is the exponential of minus i over h bar integral up to t of e 1 of t prime dt prime times the state 1. I claim this solves the Schrodinger equation, i h bar dt of this psi should be equal to h psi. Is it clear? Yes, I think it's clear. It solves it because if you take the time derivative of this thing, it multiplies by um, um, e1. The i h bar cancels that factor of i minus i over h bar. The time derivatives brings out an e1 of t. But this state, despite the phase, when h acts on it, it goes through the phase, hits the state 1, and produces the e1 energy. So uh, this is solved by that uh, equation. And you can do the integral, uh, it looks okay, it's the exponential of minus i alpha t squared over 4h bar 1, and the state psi 2 of t is the same exponential with e2, with 2 here, and it's the exponential of plus i alpha t squared over 4h bar 2. OK, let's appreciate the lesson again. We got a very simple system, two levels crossing. They cross. The energy levels cross. That Generally, it doesn't happen. You have to have a very special Hamiltonian for the energy levels to cross. We found the instantaneous energy eigenstates, and we found two exact solutions of the Schrodinger equation, two perfect, complete, exact solutions of the Schrodinger equation that represent the system doing just zoom like that or doing like that totally oblivious that there's a state they're crossing, the Schrodinger equation doesn't couple them in this case.